Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have an amazing show for you this evening. Rod Machado is here with us. It's going to be a great evening of uh, education, entertainment, humor, so many things. I am just thrilled to, to have Rod here with us. Before we get started, a couple quick notes. First of all, um, uh, tonight's broadcast will be recorded, and you can see that on Social Flight's YouTube channel. Simply go to uh, YouTube and search for Social Flight, one word, Social Flight, and then uh, usually it takes us about one to two days to get that recording up there. During the broadcast, you will be able to post questions in the Q&A feature here, and uh, those questions are, are not going to be directly asked of Rod as we do, but if I can fit some of those into the commentary and the discussion that we have, I will certainly do that and uh, we'll try to include that as much as possible. Now, before we get started, I'd like to talk a little bit, as I usually do, about an update of things that we're seeing here from Social Flight. Um, one of the uh, things, of course, as you know, Social Flight was created at its essence to support general aviation. We're here to help drive flying, to help our community, and we are, as a community and as a passion, a very vulnerable one in many ways. Uh, and uh, during the crisis, certainly uh, we have seen that to a great degree. And I would like to encourage people, as we see uh, throughout the country and throughout the world, uh, and uh, obviously an increase in rates and a, a potential that stressors will continue to rise uh, in terms of our entire world, that, um, that we continue to support general aviation. And if you have the opportunity to fly safely and do so with safe social distancing, um, we're really encouraging you to, to do that and to help support FBOs, businesses, and everything that is in our vulnerable community in general aviation, because we all, we all uh, uh, really uh, do well when, when aviation as a whole is doing well. And so be sure to do that. If you're looking at getting a takeout, do it from an airport restaurant. And uh, if you're even remotely considering doing, upgrading your aircraft, or upgrading your flight bag with a new headset. This is a great time to do that. Speaking of which, another quick thing is that we are only days away from the end of Social Fight's Fly to Win Challenge for this particular giveaway. And we have a Lightspeed Zulu 3 that'll be given away on December 1st. All you need to do is get the Social Flight mobile app. It's free, go out there, fly, check in, even at one airport and you are entered to win that headset. And so uh, uh, thanks to uh, Lightspeed for that. Be sure to do that. And of course, following December 1st, we'll have another giveaway. We do it all the time. And there have been tens of thousands of dollars in prizes that we have given away. So everything that we can do to support general aviation, we are here for. And uh, we certainly ask that, uh, that you do the same, anything that you can do to help support our industry and our local businesses. Now, uh, with that, I'd like to uh, uh, move on, of course, to uh, our favorite guest tonight, our featured guest, Rod Machado, aviation uh, legend, uh, educator, humorist. He is always one of the highlights when you go to EAA, Air Venture, Oshkosh, Sun and Fun, any of these other things. Rod has given seminars in defensive flying, handling in-flight emergencies, and aviation humor. Um, he is an ATP pilot. Um, uh, with, uh, with over 8,000 hours, most of it while giving dual instruction. And uh, I'll tell you, for someone with 8,000 hours, uh, he still gets excited to, uh, as excited to fly, see a, a Cessna 150 fly by as anything else. And if that's not enough, my understanding is that he keeps his students in line with the knowledge that he holds black belts in both Taekwondo, Aikido, and also has trained for over a decade in Brazilian-based Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, uh, and his books, if anyone is out there and able to uh, take a look at them, they're absolutely wonderful books. They include Rob Machado's Private Pilot's Handbook, Instrument Pilot's Handbook, Instrument Pilot's Survival Manual. My, my personal favorite, if you're going to title a book, it's How to Fly an Airplane. That's it. Uh, it's like a mic drop, Rod. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jeffrey. You are so kind. I do appreciate that very, very much. And uh, thanks for the mention of the Cessna 152. I I do like the one fit. Actually, I, I still enjoy watching a Cessna 150 flyby. It's an amazing. I like the Cessna 150 flyby more than the Mooney flyby, the Bonanza flyby, the 747 flyby. And the reason is it just lasts so much longer. <laughs> I mean, you have a five knot win. It's like half a day. 
So it's a, it's a wonderful <laughs> experience. Hey, listen, let me, before we start, uh, two things. Number one, I was looking for the image enhancement button on my on my panel here and uh, not like, unlike Zoom, I don't see one. And if you do have an image enhance, enhancement button and if it's working, uh, well, too bad for me. <laughs> so uh, so uh, nevertheless, I, it, I really do appreciate the things that you do in aviation with social flight. You are making a, a an amazing contribution to general aviation to be able to have one location where you can go and find uh, all the different annou the announcements for webinars, uh, for uh, seminars, for safety programs. Th that's amazing. All just focused in that one area, and that's a it's a wonderful contribution. And uh, you, you you probably had so much safety and uh, such a safety advantage to general aviation. And uh, I, for one, do appreciate it. And certainly, all the people that I know that I talk to about it seem to appreciate it very much too. So kudos to you. Thank you. That is very, very kind of you to say that and means a lot, obviously, coming from you. Um, I, I'd like to, you know, you, you talk about you, you've been in this industry for, for a very long time and uh, you, you joke about image enhancement here. I, I don't know whether it's the humor or the uh, uh, martial arts or whatever it is, or whether there's a painting hanging in your attic somewhere that is aging while you're not. But but somehow you've stood the test of time in a way that uh, that's absolutely remarkable. So, so and how so, you do that as a flight instructor is amazing. So what you're saying is the image enhancement button is working. Yes. <laughs> uh, apparently it's working really well because uh, I don't know the guy you're talking about here, but, <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, nevertheless, you're very kind. You know, I, I uh, happen to have a uh, love-hate relationship with the sun, mostly hate. You know, you got to stay out of the sun. The way I figure it, only an another four billion years and I won't have to worry about it. So uh, it'll just fizzle out. So, uh, but, you know, listen, aviation has been very, very good to me. And uh, it's uh, such, you know, it, aviation business is not only the, uh, the business of doing something adventurous, it's also people business. And uh, the people aspect is something I enjoy very, very much. I, 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 you know, I went to school to study psychology and did graduate work in psychology. And I find that all very exciting and wonderful and learned a lot about why rats turn right. Uh, I can tell you anything by it about why a rat does what it does. But if you really want to learn something about the way people think, here's what you do. You put them in a little metal con container. You attach a motor to that container, then you allow it to move through the air through some sometimes difficult to comprehend aerodynamic principles. And there's only 17 cubic feet of space in that, uh, in that little uh, canister, and that's called the Cessna 150. And you'll learn so much about human behavior it's it's just insane. It is a uh, an amazing experience to be able to actually take a psychological principle, test it, see if it works, and if it doesn't work, then you apply another technique. I don't know if you get a chance to do that as much in in uh, traditional research or experimental or clinical psychology, but uh, you certainly get a chance to do that in an airplane. It's always got you thinking, you know, my gosh, am I doing the right thing here? Am I not doing the right thing? And uh, sometimes it's kind of a scary thought too. There was a Cessna 150 I soloed a student in one time and the aircraft number was November 0007. In other words, the last three uh, numbers were 007. And as he's taxiing out, I had this existential moment. I thought, hmm, 007, 007, hmm, license to kill. Hmm, well, I need to go get this guy. Maybe I shouldn't let him solo, but well, there. I've had scarier experiences than that. But it's a, it's so much fun, though. I, it, the ex instructing is, is uh, such an educational experience. So is is it, you have obviously a very unique approach to this, which is certainly a, a blend of your background. I don't know which chicken and egg came, you know, what came first with the aviation psychology blended with your personality. But was the cockpit as a flight instructor was was that your area to con to to conduct experiments in learning on how to teach and what your flavor was going to be and what works with students and doesn't. Yeah, pretty much. You know, it, it, it's uh, it, talk about an, an, an empirically based environment uh, for deciding what does work and what doesn't work. It became very clear to me uh, when I started instructing that uh, when you tell somebody something, it, it doesn't mean that they actually understand it. It just means the words were received. 
And as a flight instructor, you have to find ways to be able to make sure that a behavior is changed because as you know, learning is nothing more than a relatively permanent change in, in behavior, yours or someone else's. And uh, uh, unlike teaching math, when you teach people to fly, if you teach them wrong, they'll go out and bend metal or bend bones. Uh, either one is not good, and uh, the latter, of course, is much, much worse. When you teach somebody math, if you teach them wrong and they don't uh, factor an equation properly, um, unless you know, you're you're an engineer, uh, that is not going to cause them a lot of great consternation in their life. But if you're an engineer, then you'll in eject the Hubble telescope uh, or the first version of it into the Klingon home world. So you have to get the math <laughs> correct. But uh, so, so, so yes. But one of the things I realized many, many, many years ago when I first started teaching was that, uh, again, you, you can make the, there are two ways to get people to, to think. You can make them laugh or you can make them cry. And I prefer not to make them cry. Nobody Nobody, although I'm going to stop right there, I, I got to tell you this. A young lady said she was with her flight instructor and uh, she started she started crying, uh, you know, that she just kind of got upset with what he was doing and he was being a little hard on her and, uh, but she was toughing it out and, and he looked over and he said, are you crying? And she said, no, my temperature and dew point are just a little closer together today. Oh. <laughs> so I, I thought that was a classic response, but you see that's humor, using humor in order to deflect the, the stress of the instructor that she was gonna furlough when she got down. So, uh, but I realized you could really have a lot of fun in an airplane, reduce the stress, and uh, that I, I cannot think of a more effective way of reducing the stress for people that are, think about it, in an airplane. And what does that mean? Well, we only have two basic fears. A uh, fear of falling and a fear of loud noises. Uh, I have a fear of falling while making loud noises, but maybe that's just my thing. And you put a person in an airplane and, you know, you have loud noises, you're high, suspended up, uh, you know, several thousand feet above the ground. And so there's a natural anxiety that exists in the cockpit and tr trying to put people at ease as you're teaching them and building a level of trust, too. So humor works pretty well. And uh, I've always tried to find ways. How can I make this a little more interesting? How can I? Uh, use a little humor to uh, deflect the stress and things like that. And a good example of that is we're downwind one time and students, you know, flying and because that's how students fly. They always do this. I, I never understood quite why, but uh, I may start doing this myself, uh, every, see if it seems to work for them. But so there's students downwind and the controller uh, says 213 to Bravo, extend your downwind leg. And the student all of a sudden actually focused on the words, extend your downwind. He had not heard that before. So you have to capitalize on those momentary experiences and uh, sort of squeeze them for every bit of humor they're worth. So I looked over at the student. Student looked at me because he saw my head twist and I said, you heard him. Open the door, get your leg out there. Tower wants to see your leg. So get it out there. And, uh, I think he said, but uh, I won't be able to use rudders. And I think I responded by saying, well, it's not as if you've been using them a lot anyway. So, <laughs> but you, that's the kind of fun you can have when you fly. So as long as you, but again, as my daddy once told me, never let anybody mistake kindness for weakness. In other words, never let anybody mistake kindness for weakness. And so consequently, you can have a lot of fun, but there are times you have to be serious and uh, like 50 feet above the ground when the stall horn is going on and the airplane is starting to crank to the left because the student is doing every possible thing wrong during the landing flare. Uh, and uh, those are times you have to be serious. Right, right, that definitely makes sense. You know, it's interesting that line that I, I've certainly seen in, in you know, uh, instructors. I, I had, uh, my instructor when I learned was this very, very tough, guy that was a, a state trooper and did this on the side and had that kind of mentality but he was a wonderful mm -hmm. instructor a little bit of a teddy bear even though he looked like like you know he was about to throw you out of the airplane and and the one thing that i will credit him with that i do value in instructors is he had what must have been these nerves of steel to wait on, on to know where that line was of safety that you just mentioned Mm -hmm. And be yes. able to allow me as a student to make those mistakes and and discover many of them and correct many of them myself without having him kind of jump out of the plane already, uh, including one night that I, we were doing touch and goes at night at an airport and weren't climbing out. And he just, we were, I saw the end approaching of the runway and getting all nervous and he calmly looks over and just says, 
you're going to raise the flaps. <laughs> and like, that was it. That was the extent of it. So how, nice. as an instructor, tell me, how do you walk that line uh, of letting students learn themselves uh, versus what you, when you have to do it, when you have to take over? Well, if you get the medicated dosage correct, uh, it's, it, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, it's a, it, it is interesting because you, you, you want to have confidence. You want to display confidence in the student and you don't want those hands hovering over the controls, like, you know, vultures hovering over a, a carcass on the ground. You don't want that because that's never good for anybody. Uh, but you want to be ready on the quick draw and there are ways to do that, of course. And, and that's just keeping your hands like this on your lap, not like this ready to pounce, but you know, subtle. So in no quick movements like that. And so you can grab the control as quickly if you need to. But uh, it, it, having confidence in, in, with students no, normally comes from knowing, having a, a sort of an homogenized idea of what the average student is going to do. So you kind of get an idea what students are going to do based on the way you've taught them so far. And so typically there are not a lot of surprises when it comes to teaching them how to land. Oh, don't, don't get me wrong. There can be surprises, but there are not a lot of them generally if you've done things right. Students will surprise you, of course. So but with that in mind, I know exactly how far I can let a student go before I do have to take over. And uh, by far and large, I let the student do every single thing they can uh, by themselves. And there are two, there's, uh, there, there are two criterion that I base that on. Number one, the student cannot do anything to scare himself or herself. That's important because you don't want that to happen. That tends to leave an indelible residue of anxiety that in some cases can be uh, can be permanent and uh, that kind of fear does nobody any good. So the second thing I do is I don't want them to scare me. And so I honor the first and uh, um, seldom have problems with the second. And it's based on confidence knowing what students can and cannot do. And also probably I, I think and something most people don't think about very much is I know exactly what the airplane is capable of doing. And that sense of being able to predict airplane behavior means that if a student is flaring too high and uh, I hear uh, the you know, clearly the airplane speed is starting to slow down. And I know uh, in, unless that nose is, is lowered or power is added, that the airplane can be too high above the ground and then suddenly start to settle. So, but you can sense that. You can hear the high-pitched noises coming from the air vents and uh, the high-pitched noises coming from maybe passengers in back or, uh, <laughs> or from the instructor. The high-pitched noises coming from the instructor. Those things are all the clues that let you know. So uh, that's kind of how that works. If you have confidence in your ability to fly an airplane, that makes all the difference in the world. And I have to say that uh, there are a lot of people that teach flying that Nowadays, unlike it was perhaps uh, many years ago, although it, you know I don't want to kid myself, I'm sure this problem has existed for uh, all throughout aviation, and that is uh, we don't really feel as confident sometimes in flying our airplane and uh, uh, knowing what the airplane will do right on the edge of a stall, so to speak, because num number one, we don't teach slow flight at minimum controllable airspeed anymore. Hmm. And uh, you can start to see that at the airport because people are no longer feeling comfortable approaching at 30% above stall speed, but they feel great approaching at 60% above stall speed which is a great way to land if you want to burn off your tires. And not recommended, I might add. So uh, confidence in airplane flying is extremely important. That seems like a, an area, I mean, you, you mentioned that, that you know, put the, being on the lower end of the envelope of speed and power and, and getting to learn about that part of things, that does seem like an area that's changed somewhat. Um, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, a, an interesting thing. Look, if you're really lucky, you get a chance to, you learn to fly at a flight school that uh, is a, well, for lack of a better phrase, a stick and rudder flight school. In other words, the emphasis is placed on attitude flying. I was very fortunate back in 1970 uh, to start flying at a flight school at uh, Amelia Reed Aviation in Northern California. And it was, uh, you know, it was, they had L2s and BC-12D Taylor crafts. And these were old, that the L2 is a warbird aircraft, actually. Uh, yeah. And I, we learned to fly in that. And that was an amazing thing to, to be in. Uh, the air, the, the flight school did need a little upgrade. I, I mean, it's, uh, it could use a, it could have used a, some newer aircraft. I think the right flyer was still on lease back <laughs> uh, there. But I, I will say in defense of the, the flight school that we did have the latest in 
Gosport tube and wing warping technology. So it was a very good, and, and the latest nav system uh, too, because we had like a rock with moss on it. So you could always, uh, and one airplane even had a remote compass. Uh, they kept it in another hangar at another airport. <laughs> so uh, not in the airplane, so remote compass. So that's how that worked. But it was a great school because when you learn to fly on a tail dragger, not that that's necessary to be a competent pilot, but it's just uh, an advantage. So uh, I learned to fly on the tail dragger and it was, uh, it was an amazing experience, just a tremendous amount of fun. And that idea of attitude flying, in other words, attitude plus power, uh, equals performance. Attitude, power, and trim. It's got a nice cadence to it, and that's what you learn. That's how you learn to think as a stick and rudder pilot uh, in terms of attitude, select the attitude, certain amount of power, not throttle position, power. Throttle position and power are two different things because like in my Cessna 150, we have two, two power settings, fly, no fly. Two throttle settings, fly, no fly. And at high density altitude, it's no fly, no fly. So it doesn't make, doesn't make that much difference there. So attitude, power, and trim, and then learning the principles of uh, flying attitude, you know, the five basic attitudes that we have. And that gives you so much confidence in knowing what the airplane will do. Plus, uh, the fact that you're learning to fly at exceptionally slow speeds, and when the airplane does stall, if it does stall, you know how to recover from the stall. Stalls are not something that should scare you. And uh, over the years, I've had, you know, I've flown with many people that, uh, from other instructors that are just deathly afraid of doing stalls. In fact, I've sort of made a... Uh, uh, a mini reputation in the sense that when people come out to uh, fly uh, for a proficiency flight, which I still do quite a few of, uh, if they feel uncomfortable about any aspect of flying, uh, I'll find out what it is and we'll go up and we'll take care of it. And the majority of problems that they have uh, can fall into two ca categories. Number one, crosswind landings and number two, stalls. And mm. once you once you cure those things, uh, it's, it's amazing how much confidence people uh, will have because they can predict what the airplane will do. If you right. can do that, tremendous confidence. You know, that's it's fascinating that you mentioned that. Uh, the, the first aircraft that I ever owned was a Grumman Traveler, an A5 Traveler. And I ah. remember it, it, I owned it and I flew it for a while. And it wasn't until I first went to a, a convention of owners there and went up with someone who uh, was an instructor and absolutely just knew this plane like the back of its hand, who basically said, let me show you what this plane can actually do. Mm -hmm. and he yeah. brought it up it over, the runway, and, and, you know, where I thought we are way too high to be, mm -hmm. ever be able to make the runway and showed me how you can slow it way down, put it into this slip, do these things. And it changed the behavior so dramatically of the airplane. I was so scared as a very low time pilot of that speed regime of being at that slow thinking like, oh, I'm going to spin it. Oh, I'm going to do all these things. Yes. Yes. And I was missing out on a huge amount of the capability oh. of the aircraft. Yes, no, no, the same no. is even true of the Bonanza we fly now. And so it's a really wonderful point. Yeah, well, well, think about it. I th I th talk about people getting nervous. Think about it. I'm going to say to you this. Let's assume you have some basic flying skills. You, you've taken seven or eight lessons. And I say to you, we're going to do this. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to go out and fly uh, at a slow speed, close to the ground and then we're going to get closer to the ground and fly at an even slower speed and then we're going to get really close to the ground and then we're going to be right on the edge of a stall and you would think oh my gosh no my god we can't do that because we we don't have a daredevil permit uh it's not allowed the fa is going to shut everybody down no 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 that's called landing is what it is and that's exactly what we do when we land an airplane. We get closer to the ground and we get slower and at a higher angle of attack and eventually touch down at a, at a near stall angle of attack. So here's what I do. Here's how I can tell the, it, it gives you a rough gauge as to what someone's comfort feeling is in an airplane. I'll say, would you stall an airplane at 3000 feet? And most people go, oh yeah, stop 3000 feet. I say, fine. Would you stall an airplane at 2000 feet? Yeah, no problem. I'll stall at 2,000 feet. And I'll say, okay, would you stall an airplane at 1,500 feet? Well, you know, I don't know about that. Well, that's the minimum altitude uh, in the ACS at which most of these maneuvers, stalls, slow flight, and what have you are uh, expected to be done, the minimum altitude. Then I say, would you stall an airplane at 1,000 feet? Oh, no, 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 no. 
I said, okay, so you're telling me you wouldn't stall an airplane at 500 feet above ground level. Oh, no, no, no. The deal is, I would have, and I'm not saying this because I want you to do it or anybody else to do it, I, I would have absolutely no problem stalling any airplane, general aviation airplane I've ever flown um, at 500 feet above ground level, just doing a complete full stall. I, I wouldn't. I'm not going to do a spin, of course, that would be foolish, but I would have no problem doing a stall. Not that I want anybody to go out and do that. I want to make sure that that's clear. I want, hey, Rod said that uh, we can do a stall at 500 feet. He <laughs> recommends it, and I should do it on my next flight. Don't tell like my instructors me. everywhere are about to send you emails. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just saying me. So uh, don't, don't, don't send me the, send them to, send them to, to Jeff. Yeah, Jeff, so send yeah. them to Jeff. <laughs> and, and uh, but I would have no problem doing that because I know exactly what the airplane is going to do. If I didn't, I wouldn't do such a thing. And I could see why people are scared about doing that. But there's nothing wrong with stalling an airplane at 1,500 feet, 2,000 feet. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy to think that you could stall an airplane and lose control and lose 1,500 feet of altitude. That's silly. You should lose no more than 25 feet if you lose any altitude at all off of full stall. Well, you'll lose a few feet, but not much. So the, mm -hmm. there's the point. You have to have confidence. And the number of people that I've flown with over the years that you put them in an airplane and, and it, it's a struggle to get this thing down. It's like Crocodile Dundee wrestling a gator to the ground. It's, uh, and, and yet airplanes were designed to fly. And mm -hmm. if we just let them do the thing they're supposed to do by proper trimming and attitude control, uh, and I'm not oversimplifying, I'm just telling it like it is, uh, then yeah. once you be able to fly fairly, uh, fairly well, fairly quickly. As a matter of fact, one of the most uh, amazing books that I've read was called uh, From the Ground Up by Fred Wick. And it was uh, Fred Wick's uh, 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 building of the air coop and what he went through in building the air coop and the air coop has always been one of the most amazing airplanes to me uh because the airplane the the, the first version of the air coop didn't have rudder pedals and right. it, it basically just had ailerons aileron and rudder interconnects you turn the aileron the rudders deflect and the way it was built uh you could do that and it had gear that when you land in a crab the gear would flex and the airplane would straighten out according to its ground track as long as the nose gear was held off the ground when you touch down. So the airplane would straighten out and you lower the nose. Well, it's interesting because Fred Wick in his book said that the average time for solo in an air coupe in the late 1930s was 4.6 hours. 4.6. Wow. Think about that. 4.6 hours. I soloed somebody in an air coupe once and it was about 4.7, I think. Uh, and that was at John Wayne Airport radio controlled, a radio uh, a controlled uh, tower controlled airport and uh, th they have radios there you know and um, the uh, this is why I should never be left alone without adult supervision actually uh, use your words and so radio controlled airport tower controlled airport and uh, he adapted very well he was an ex-army green beret uh, perhaps that's why he worked the radio so well I don't know 4.6 hours no flying time whatsoever just like Fred Fred Wick and I thought, why did he do that? How could he solo so quickly? He just did it. And it, it, it was obvious the airplane didn't have rudder pedals. And if the airplane didn't have rudder pedals, all he had to do was basically drive it just like a car, skills he already had, because he had a car that he brought to the airport. And landing and flaring only took basically two hours to, uh, uh, to a, a skill that took two hours to acquire. That is amazing when you think about it. So when someone says, as an example, I don't feel confident landing in a cross and what have you, typically it's an issue with lack of understanding of aileron and rudder. Those things down, those shiny little objects down there on the floorboard of the airplane with a nice glean on it uh, <laughs> where they've never been touched before and never been tarnished <laughs> by human feet. So. <laughs> So, so do you yeah. think that, I mean, does that go and, and lend credence to the people who kind of say, oh, we've lost so much by not training everyone in tail draggers uh, versus uh, now? You, you ask such great questions. And by the way, I just want to make it clear, this is iced tea, all right? So <laughs> it's not anything else. Oh, you'll need What's stronger on? stuff by the time I'm done with you, Rod. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you're working your magic. Your game is deep here, my friend. Uh, so I, I'm trying to keep up with you. Uh, yeah, no telling what kind of webinar you would get if I did that, but 
Never. Uh, the uh, skills that we have, you asked such a great question, I decided to completely forget it. So what was the question again? The question is, so do you think, does that lend more credence to the people of like kind of the old school view of t learning in a tail dragger is, is a better way to learn that it teaches you the skills that you need before you move on? Well, it's a good, uh, again, good question. It's optimal. Um, uh, I, I don't want to say better because you can learn the same skills in a Cessna 150. Uh, you, you know, the, let's face it, on the ground is where the rudder is really necessary in a tail dragger. But in the air, until you touch down, it's the same as in a Cessna 150. Uh, not as much, of course, in a, a Cherokee 140 uh, or a Cessna 172, but certainly in a 150 where, you know, there are no rudder aileron interconnects. So you have no, you, you really have to have a skills that allow use of both of those things together. It's not a hard skill to develop, by the way. Uh, it just takes some concentrated effort by the instructor. Oh, excuse me. The instructor has to have the skill him or herself in order to be able to train it in. And uh, with all due respect to my fellow instructors, uh, that is something that we just don't teach as much. We don't emphasize as much today. I ask the average designee, whenever I can talk to the designees, uh, I, I get a chance to do that. And um, I ask them this question. I say, I, if you were required to fail somebody on a check ride for lack of rudder use, flying coordinated, and by the way, they are required because uh, that's part of the ACS, flying coordinated. Is, it, actually, it actually says that in the ACS. Uh, I said, how many people would you fail? Give me a percentage. And, you know, they say anywhere between 30 percent, 40 percent, somewhere around there. I won't even tell you how high it goes because it's kind of sh shocking. But the fact is that lack of rudder and aileron coordination is a big skill. But then again, so is lack of attitude control, too. So uh, ba basically, we're taught to struggle with an airplane. And in reality, uh, you don't need to struggle as much as you need to anticipate and apply the skills that uh, go into attitude flying. I don't want to oversimplify, but really it's not that complicated. Right, oh, that makes a lot of sense, definitely. So, you, I mean, you covered you, know, you covered slow flight, which obviously can transform where everything about how people fly, including what airports they can fly to themselves. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, rudders, uh, use of rudder pedal. What else kind of jumps into your mind of, God, if there were something I would have every student learn or even every existing pilot out there learn a little bit better to take more out of aviation, is there something else that jumps into your mind? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, I'll give you, an, uh, by way of example, many years ago, I was standing down, I was standing at John Wayne Airport out at the, uh, uh, you know, on, on the tarmac and uh, I had to, uh, the airplane open. I'm just sitting idling, uh, waiting for, oh gosh, I guess to take off. I'm not, I don't quite remember exactly what the in environment was, but I hear somebody turn downwind in a Comanche 250, and I hear this, tower, tower, mayday, 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 emergency, I'm landing, I'm landing, and the tower said, Roger, clear to land, clear to land, what's the nature of your emergency? And I kid you not, the guy goes, my airspeed has just failed, ah, and his airspeed failed. And I'm thinking his airspeed failed. The airspeed indicator is no longer reading 70, 65, whatever. It just went to zero because a kamikaze bee dove right into the pitot tube where bees like to dive into and his airspeed failed. And I'm thinking, wow, isn't that amazing? Somebody who's so dependent on his or her instrument, in this case, his instruments, to feel that that's the only way they can know how an airplane flies, then that is a, uh, that's a sad thing. And I would say if there's one thing that uh, is missing with uh, many of the people uh, trained today, I know I sound just like my dad. I sound just like my dad. Well, when I was younger, you know, of course, <laughs> when he was younger, yeah, those things actually did happen. But, uh, but, but in my case, uh, I, I know I sound just like him, but that's, that's exactly the case here. They don't or are not taught the sense of flying using all of your senses, sight, mm. sound, feel, uh, you know, tactile, kinesthetic, 
smell in some cases in terms of uh, in-flight fires and, and things like that, or <laughs> ruptured fuel lines or something. Teaching all those senses, we don't do that. And, and how I teach those senses on the very first flight I uh, take with a student is for the very first portion of the flight, I just cover up the panel. I just put a big towel over the panel. Or sometimes I'll use no peakies because that's, uh, that's always, I love applying those. You know, the soap dish holder with the 50 suction cups, that's so much fun wet like that right there on the airspeed indicator and so um i'll cover the airspeed indicator perhaps cover cover a few other instruments or just put a towel over the uh, the dash and say we're going to fly by by attitude and on any flight review i give uh that i require these students and you know i say require most students or most people are more than willing to do this i get a little nervous at first uh, we're going to land the airplane without using any of the instruments and i just cover the panel up and uh at first they're pretty anxious and uh, it takes a while to get used to that but then you can start to feel the airplane the subtle sound you can sense when you're getting close to to the stall when you're slipping or skidding or something like that so consequently it uh, it's some it's a skill you can acquire and I wish more people uh, more pilots flying today uh, had it it makes a lot of sense I mean that kind of seat of your pants feel of of, of ability to 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 do that it, it does seem like something that that's missing in some cases, at least from some pilots, that they can relax. And and what's amazing to me about that is it increases your joy of flying so much when you have that. Oh, that's a very, very good point, uh, Jeffrey. Because when you're if you're always frightened of your airplane, <laughs> what kind of joy can you have? You're sweating all the time and struggling and uh, there's just there's never any reason to do that. And and you may think, well, you know, because you have ten thousand hours of flying time over a 50 year period yeah okay yeah that's that's fine that's true you do build a lot of confidence over that amount of time but i've got to tell you i i know private pilots uh like uh well mine and many other people many other good instructors that uh, that do their job very very well that are supremely confident but not cocky and there's a big difference between the two confident enough to know what they don't know and mm. so and they fly very very well and you know and they don't rush you know it's that old phrase uh, uh slow is uh, slow is smooth smooth is fast and uh, that is a uh, you know i've always tried to Im uh, imbue that kind of thinking in my students we don't rush uh, we take our time, make decisions, and always operate on the conservative side, and always have Plan B and sometimes Plan C. And it's not difficult to have a Plan B in in aviation. So uh, those are things that uh, can be inculcated in the student psyche uh, with uh, just with basic good training. You know, one of the things I really like about your approach with this is it we you know so many times the loss of an instrument we only think of in terms of, of failure, in terms of managing an emergency or managing a failure or managing a situation and, or instrument flight and then same type of coping. It's a high stress thing. And it's the first time that I've really thought about it and having this conversation listening to you that actually there's this wonderful opportunity to approach it kind of like the feel the force thing, put the blast helmet on and, mm -hmm. and like the idea that no, here's what we're going to do. Like, we're going to fly a pattern and do a bunch of work here in this plane with covering over the instruments, not because they failed, but because you actually know in your heart from having done hundreds of landings uh, that, or even if you haven't even done a hundred, you know what it feels like, you know what it sounds like, you know what your butt feels if you're dropping out and need to you know, get, get more lift. We're just gonna experience it. That's a pretty yes. profound approach. I love that. Very, very true. I you said the force. I knew you were a Star Wars Wars fan. Yeah, don't <laughs> deny it. Don't deny it. I I knew it. I could just tell. So were your sons too. They had to be Star Wars fans. Um, yeah, the uh, feel the force or feel the forces, if you want to be technically correct, all four of them, and um, that is a um, it's an interesting way of looking at flying because, in that sense, we've moved uh, everything that we teach nowadays is sort of antithetical to that. Think about it. I want you to fly by the seat of your pants, but I'm gonna put you in an airplane that has some of the most sophisticated TV machinery, something that you would never see on a showroom floor over at one of the electronic shops. Uh, and I still want you to fly by feel. So 
uh, the things that the environment is not conducive to learning to fly by that sense of, of comfort. And you think, well, okay, then one should derive comfort from all the instrumentation in the airplane. Maybe so. But that means you are dependent then on something that can be taken away from you. No, it can't be taken away that easy. And you reach over and turn off the master switch. <laughs> and then it's all gone. Not that not that, that can't happen. It's just the fact that in the back of someone's mind, they know it can happen. Mm -hmm. It's not the, the probability that causes the problem. It's the possibility mm -hmm. that causes the problem for most people. So in a sense, uh, they're, if they don't have, as an example, good pilot pilotage skills or good dead reckoning skills, uh, they take off and they're, they're dependent on their movie map display. And in a sense, they're thinking, hey, if this quit, quits, I'm lost. Well, in that sense, in some philosophical sense, they are lost the moment they take off. They just don't know it yet. Maybe they won't find out. So uh, that's a very philosophical approach uh, to, uh, to, to a way to think about it. I love discussing philosophy with you anyway, but uh, <laughs> one of my favorite questions is if there are tires in the ocean, why are there no fish on the freeway? See, that's a good <laughs> philosophical question. Much more difficult to answer than the one that you just posed. So I, I, I like, like that. Question. But the whole, I mean, what you're raising here is absolutely fascinating to me because it, I mean, like you said, no matter how beautiful and new the airplane is, no matter how packed it is with automation and, and, and technology and glass panels, the outside is still the same shell that most of our planes out there were 50 years ago to begin with. And, and so that's, that's ultimately what you're flying and, and have the opportunity to experience that it doesn't matter whether you're in the J3 Cub or you're in the, the yeah. Bonanza or Cirrus or, or whatever you're flying. Uh, I mean, you think back on, remember that old uh, video or story of like the 707, I think it was, when it made its first flight over the Bay Area and managed to, ro and he ro and the pilot rolled it during that? Yeah. It doesn't matter what the aircraft is, you can no, fly by the seat of your pants. Yeah, that was Tex Johnson. I think he was a test pilot for uh, for, Tita, for Boeing. and. Uh, and uh, also his last day on the job. So uh, no, I think I fired him. Yeah, but it was amazing. You could actually roll a 747, but a 707. But it's just an airplane, and all airplanes are just airplanes. And uh, people that learn those stick and rudder skills, they end up uh, uh, being able to transition from one airplane to the next, uh, with you know a few exceptions. There are a few wild, crazy birds out there that uh, you know they uh, require sophisticated skills to handle, but. Uh, as, as you said, an airplane is, is just an airplane. But I think most important though, and you said the word, uh, the, the pleasure you derive from flying. Uh, I remember turning off the master switch and, and shutting down uh, the movie map display. Uh, a guy had a Garmin 530, I think in this case, and I, I shut it down and he said, hey, without the movie map, I, 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 don't, I can't see where the airport's at and what have you. And I said, well, you actually have another movie map. Actually, you have six of them on this airplane. Actually seven, you got two in back, Two in the side, two up here, and then one up in front. So you have you have a lot of moving maps. They're moving all over the place, especially since you don't <laughs> use rudder. And so uh, we'll use those for a while. And but that's what breeds confidence. And in that sense, we have to come full circle. And by way of analogy here, you know, you start off in martial arts training with a white belt. You proceed up to colored belts. You get the darkest belt you can, the black belt. And then when you practice more and more and more and more, that black belt eventually fades and wears and returns back into a white belt. And the a symbology here is you return to your original state, <clears throat> the state of of innocence and na naivete, better, better way to phrase it, na innocence, uh, but yet with wisdom. And that is a, a great analogy for general aviation because we eventually get our experience. We learn to fly. Yeah, we do all the fancy things. We fly jets and what have you. But if you look at many people that have that true love of aviation, uh, they will make that return journey and eventually end up, if they haven't strayed too far, they'll end up back in a small aircraft where you can actually feel like you're flying again. I see this with airline pilots that love general aviation. I see this with a, just a lot of general aviation pilots. They buy the biggest fancy airplane they can get when they 
get more experience and they get a little bit more money and then they have these wonderful airplanes and and then later on in life as long as their ego doesn't have too much of a grip on their ability to function correctly or fu function uh, uh, it, 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 uh, Honestly, they'll end up with a small airplane and say, you know, I just love flying because it's just so much fun being up in the air and they enjoy it and they can enjoy it because they have the skills that allow them to predict what the airplane's going to do. It's a very, very good question you asked. Isn't that a fascinating uh, concept? I love the one with the, of the concept of as you as you go through the belts progression. And isn't it a fascinating concept that so many people talk uh, uh, about uh, who are very experienced in life looking back and you know if i only had this you know appreciated this earlier on and you mentioned as you said so many pilots wind up their careers towards the later part stages of their life in simple aircraft in in really the purest form of enjoying that and you almost wonder how how much sweeter would flying have been the entire time if when you had all that heavy metal or the, or the heavy electronics or all the things that you had, you also had that appreciation for stick and rudder and that appreciation for the feel of the airplane that you got later in life. Yes, yeah, a, a, a very good point. And uh, not to take away from uh, the fact that some people find great enjoyment and pleasure out of being able to integrate uh, their physical skills with technology. And that's a wonderful thing. And it's, uh, uh, I certainly have enjoyed doing that. I had a Cessna two, a P210 with, you know, I had stuff in there I didn't even know was in there. You know, a radar <laughs> altimeter, I knew it was in there. But we had double vacuum system, Aztec 65 autopilot, roll steering. It was insane. It was just an amazing aircraft. The, the P210 was one of the best kept se secrets in general aviation anyway. I love that airplane. Uh, one thing I realized, and Richard Collins uh, said this many years ago. He said at 20,000 feet, he said it's a long way down from 20,000 feet in a general aviation airplane. In other words, what the point was and what I took away from uh, Richard Collins was that uh, that airplane needs to be flown seriously. It needs to be flown uh, carefully and it required, and here's the operative word, a lot of work to fly if you're going to fly it safely. And I enjoyed it. <clears throat> but a part of me also doesn't want to work that hard in an airplane because there was so much planning and preparation if you're going to do it safely. I just like going out on my Cessna 150. I don't have to worry about pressurization. I don't have to worry about turbocharging. I don't have to worry about, you know, being at 20,000 feet, unless of course I happen to be over uh, the uh, the simulacrum of Mount St. Helens when it blows uh, or gets sucked up, uh, up into a thunderstorm and popped out at 50,000 feet. I don't have to worry about that. You know, uh, maybe 6,000 feet is the uh, highest altitude I typically fly at and uh, but typically much less if I can get away with it. And it's just a joy. It is so much fun. And so I take my time. I love the sound of the, the I love the sound the airplane makes. I love the smell of av gas before I get in the airplane. Hopefully not too much av gas, of course, uh, because you don't want to smell too, too much of that. You got to leak somewhere. I love the sound, the, the vibration of the airplane. I just absolutely love how that airplane feels when you put that power in and in the Cessna 150 and then you wait, you know, 15, 20 seconds and actually start to feel that acceleration and uh, you get up some speed. Okay, maybe 20 seconds. I just exaggerated. <laughs> 25 seconds. Let's be realistic. You start to accelerate, you pull the airplane and it lurches into the air. I, that just never gets old. It just never gets old. As, as a matter of fact, I love the landing, but I got to tell you, I think I love the takeoff more. That's just between you and me, okay? And, uh, <laughs> yes. I love the takeoff. And the value of Cessna 150s rise everywhere during this conversation. Um, so, <laughs> so it does. What a coincidence. <laughs> so, Rod, take me through. Let, let's do a little little experiment here. Be let's say the uh, the the I won't say best best of the worst but the what's been won and what's been lost in uh, over the years that you've been involved in in seeing uh, instruction general aviation and teaching the, the way that we teach students what like what do you think's gotten uh, tops on your list has gotten a lot better been a great advantage with, uh, in any way and what what could we pull back from from what we used to have and implement now Okay, the gains. Uh, uh, the, the, perhaps the most 
noticeable, most obvious gain would be that uh, we do a much better job in aviation of educating pilots. Um, no doubt about that. Uh, we, uh, we're, we're, we're much more proactive in terms of uh, uh, safety seminars and flying techniques, and there's a lot less mystery and a lot less mysticism uh, in terms of how an airplane is flown. And believe me, some people have some very strange ideas about how airplanes are actually flown. But uh, I think we're more grounded in reality now. And flight, e flight instructors have become uh, more educated in that sense. Uh, the book knowledge is there, and certainly the flying knowledge uh, is there. So that that's a good thing. And you see it in the accident statistics. And my friend Pete Campbell, who originated the who was an FA inspector, one of the most amazing, actually one of the funniest FA guys I've ever met in my life. Wow. Just an amazing teacher. Hold on a second. Did, did you say the funniest FAA guys? <laughs> yes. Yes, I actually said that. No, that's not a contradiction. There's nothing wrong with my electrical system here on my computer. I actually said that. He's Pete Campbell actually started the FAA safety seminar program back in the mid-1960s and the flight instructor revalidation program. And after six years of the uh, teaching requiring flight instructors to attend a, a, re a flight instructor refresher course every two years, the accident flight instructor accident rate dropped 67%. And we've seen the same thing with safety seminars in general aviation too, something very comparable. So that's the good thing. Uh, the bad thing is that I, and I, and I don't want to say bad, but I think the thing that makes it more difficult uh, on two levels, one for somebody to enjoy their airplane, and, and, and enjoy flying. Um, and, and that is we, we don't have a good way of ensuring the training success of people who get involved in, av in aviation. <clears throat> and let me make that point this way. Uh, the Chinese have a wonderful phrase. It sounds much better in the original Mandarin uh, and, and I won't say it in the original ma Mandarin because that would create an international uh, uh, serious uh, problem here. So uh, I will say it this way. The average, it's better to spend three years looking for a good instructor than to spend three minutes with a bad one. I don't know of any more powerful, useful, effective, poignant uh, aphorism for general aviation than that one right there. Going to, to the airport, taking flying lessons is just a happenstance experience. You know, it's, it's the luck of the draw. You may get a good instructor, you may get a bad instructor, but here's the problem. When you go to the chiropractor and you get a got bad chiropractor, you walk away with a double kink in your neck rather than just <laughs> one kink when you uh, lay down on the table. You go to the airport, you take a, a lesson from a bad instructor, he or she, typically a he, scares you to death and he has ruined aviation for you for the rest of your life. And I've seen that happen so many times. And that is sad. It's also a crime. It's tragic. And that, I, I don't know what to say. I, don't, I, I can't say it any stronger than that. Spend three years looking for a, a good instructor rather than spending three minutes with a bad one. Uh, and that's why I tell everybody that, that uh, is considering taking lessons. If you're considering taking lessons, what you should do is <clears throat> do a lot of gumshoe work, a lot of footwork, find somebody with a good reputation, and then and basically go to my website, look at the article under my blog that's titled uh, How to Find a Good Flight Instructor. All, all this is outlined there at rodmachado.com or <clears throat> becomeapilot.com, same place. And I tell the students that go to the airport, find an instructor, do your gumshoe work and check out the reputation and so on and so forth. And, and then schedule to fly with this instructor for no more than three lessons, max max and tell that instructor right up front let's fly for three and then at the end of three lessons we'll reevaluate and see how we dance with each other you don't have to say dance but you can say you know see how, how we're doing and whether our teaching and learning styles are actually simpatico uh, and that way at the end of three lessons if you're flying with uh, attila the hun and you don't realize it and this guy's or gal is just not the person you want to fly with because they can rub an entire city the wrong way the moment they start to talk <laughs> then you say listen 
it was a great experience and because uh, you did learn a lot right <laughs> learn never to fly with somebody like this again and then you go on and you find another flight instructor and you can do it with a great deal of comfort because you don't feel committed to this person um, we have to teach people to be good consumers in aviation and one last idea on that you know we often worry about how can we get more people in aviation i always thought that was kind of a crazy statement because we don't have trouble getting people in aviation we have trouble keeping people that we've already gotten to stay in aviation. You know, Microsoft Flight Simulator, when it first came out, the first year it uh, was available, they sold something like 2 million copies of Microsoft Flight Simulator. Wow, 2 million copies. You wouldn't sell 2 million copies of any simulation product if people weren't interested in that product. So there's this nascent uh, interest people have in aviation. Um, and th as a result, people are generally gravitate toward it. And it's pretty hard to get on an airport now unless you have a, a security clearance or you parachute in. But uh, it, when you can get to the airport and you take flying lessons and you explore that area, a good flight instructor can run everything for you. But a bad flight instructor, but a good flight instructor, a good flight instructor. And there are a lot of them out there. Believe me, I know a lot of them. I also know, unfortunately, 10 times more bad ones. You have a good flight instructor, what an amazing experience that is. And I was very fortunate because I, I had good flight instructors as I suspect you did, this fellow, this Marine that had you doing push-ups in the run-up <laughs> area because, because you deserved it. I, I, because, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure, sure, yes, That's as we all do. I mean, yeah, so, I, I mean, obviously, you, you know, I want everyone to go to that blog at rodmachado.com or, or uh, beapilots.com and, and read about those ideas of how to do it. I mean, maybe we also need a better, you know, Angie's List or whatever it is version of, of where people are, are finding flight instructors and honestly rating them and helping, helping get the word out. Yes. Reputation. Well, Jeffrey, uh, reputation is everything. So uh, you, you have to find somebody with a good reputation and reputations follow CFIs. So if you can find the reputation, uh, the reputation is uh, one signifier, one of several, but an important one that you might, might have stumbled into a, uh, the clutches of a good instructor. And, you know, I, I got to tell you, when you're with a good instructor, uh, you, you, you learn things you would not ordinarily learn. And, and <laughs> I'm, I'm drawn back to this one phrase by, uh, Gary Zukov in a book he wrote 30 years ago uh, called The Dancing Wu Li Masters. And in the book, Gary Zukov said that uh, the master does not speak of gravity until the student stands in awe of the falling leaf. Now, I don't know that sounds kind of esoteric, but the fact is that a good instructor makes you want to learn all the challenging things that you need to learn. And that is a quality that seems to be uh, uh, singular to people that have that good instructor quality or that good instructor reputation. They make you want to learn and they know how to teach. Not, that, not because they have credentials in teaching, believe me, that has nothing to do with whether you're a good teacher or not. Whether you're a good teacher or not, depends uh, more on your character than it does on your pedagogical skills because mm. people naturally learn and they can learn even in the presence of somebody that doesn't have good teaching skills but uh, that person is of good character and honestly tries to convey the information and uh, good teaching skills of course are, a, are, are an asset and right. good instructors do have those so you you know you really you, I, I i've never been as excited to talk about a subject like this uh, as the one that you brought up here because it's a a subject very close to my heart and it's one that uh, i wish more people talked about and uh, thought about and in, in particular students when they go out for training uh, people that want to learn to fly you know don't let a bad instructor run your life's experience of aviation right because well, you, you know one of the things rod that, that you're talking about it that what's what's resonating with me about this is of course there's there's personalities there's styles there's ability that go with that but but the word that keeps jumping into my head uh with this is the same word uh, that has made you what what you are to so many people in general aviation that's the word of inspiration the ability to inspire your students in addition to teaching that that's that's what gravitates people 
Uh, well, uh, another word for inspiration is just enthusiasm. Uh, yes. I, I just have a lot of, and, and, and thank you, that's very kind of you to say that, but I have a, a great deal of uh, enthusiasm for general aviation airplanes and, and, and for people, as I say, uh, as much as, as airplanes, if not more. I, I really like people. And I think any flight instructor that um, wants to really do a, a, a decent job, other than the fact that they have to learn and continuously learn, which is not difficult to do nowadays, actually. I think that uh, learning how to convey enthusiasm is very, very important. In fact, one of the things I used to, I, again, you, you bring up such great, you get me so excited. My blood pressure is probably 300 over uh, 150 right now, and that's PSI. So uh, <laughs> I hope not. Uh, the uh, The idea of knowing how to be a good student because you can't put it all on the instructor you have to know how to be a good student and one of the things i i learned a long time ago was just personally and i, I just learned hmm, if i act like a good student if i behave like a good student if i show the enthusiasm like a good student hmm, i think let me think let me think oh yeah the instructor is going to spend more time with me he's going to show or she's going to show a greater interest in me because that's the way human beings are so i learned how to be a good instructor a good a good uh, student and consequently that also taught me how to be a good instructor it's one of the best kept secrets in in all of aviation in fact in all of learning them uh, people are not taught how to be good students. You know, you sit in the, I, I taught college classes for a while and I see students sitting there, you know, looking at me like a, uh, a dog looking at a fan. And yet I, I, I know the moment that I got excited about something, then all of a sudden they got excited. Well, there are a few that didn't because they didn't get the dosage right that day. <clears throat> but uh, there were, most people got really excited when the instructor's excited. And for many instructors, the, the, uh, uh, the lectern is something that is uh, not used to hold your notes. It's used to hold the lifeless body of the instructor during <laughs> the instruction hour. And so uh, the uh, thing is you have to be enthusiastic, but you also have to be a good student. And by the way, one of the best ways to become a good student, by the way, <clears throat> since I'm into giving, uh, uh, defining my objectives in behavioral terms here is number one, <clears throat> I always look at my instructor in the eye uh, when he's talking, and I don't want to stare him down. That's not the intent, unless, of course, you want to. Sometimes that's important to do, to show alpha dominance. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I just like hearing you laugh. And then uh, what I'll do is I'll look at the bridge of his nose right here, because that way you look at the bridge of the nose, then it doesn't look like you're trying to stare him down. And then, you know, I'll, I'll look away a little bit, and I'll think, and, and I'm, I'm doing this all honestly. I'm not just faking it. I, I am sincerely interested in what he's saying. I'll say, hmm, int interesting. And then I'll ask, uh, I'll say, let me see if I understand what you're saying. And then I'll ask uh, reflective, I'll ask reflective questions. In other words, questions that uh, make sure I understand the concept being uh, conveyed. Uh, and then I'll also get excited when it's appropriate for me to get excited. I say, that is a great idea. In fact, you've seen that here, uh, me talking with you because you, br you bring up a point and I get all excited about it. And so, but there are many other ways to do that. And I've written, I think I've written several articles on this over the years, and uh, I'll have to put one of them on my blog site, how to be a good student. Makes all the difference in the world. And then again, really? you know, if you have a bad instructor, then there's nothing you can do with that lifeless body. You need to get a new instructor. Such a fascinating point. I mean, absolutely. So, Rod, before we we part with the with the show this evening, um, obviously we're we're in you know a challenging world as we opened up with that, and and I'd love to get your thoughts on general aviation and how we fit uh, in this world uh, uh, that as as we go through the the COVID crisis, as we continue through it, in 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 how how people approach their their flying and this world uh, uh, that we're all living in. Yeah, um, no, it's a good good question, and I think that uh, uh, first of all, most people have just good common sense. Pilots tend to have a lot of common sense, but because without it, uh, you end up uh, well metal plating the sides of mountains. Uh, to be graphic about it, or you scare yourself out of the air. And common sense, you know, is defined. Uh, I'll define it here. Common sense is never buying a TV from a man on a street corner who's out of breath. That's common <laughs> sense, right? Or never borrow money from anybody named Nuzio Baducci. That's also common sense. But uh, w with common sense uh, for, for the average person, uh, you, we have a pretty good idea of how to avoid 
uh, things that can hurt us, like the COVID virus. Uh, you know, it's best not to go out and associate with people that uh, of which you are not familiar. Uh, it's probably wise if you feel it so when you're in an unfamiliar environment with people to wear a mask. You know, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'm going to suggest suggest that that might be a wise thing to do. Um, and if uh, you just use some very common sense principles, that's fine. And so therefore, does that mean we can't take flying lessons? Does that mean we can't fly? No. I don't think so. I think if your flight instructor is uh, carefully monitoring his or herself to make sure that they're not overexposing themselves and uh, you do the same. And if you need to, you wear a mask in the airplane. And uh, if you want, wear the whole hazmat suit. Uh, that would look nice during a ramp check. And uh, actually it'd be perfect during a ramp check, wouldn't it? You get out of, wow, what a great idea. You, your game is deep inspiring me to dig up these incredible ideas. You get out of the airplane in a hazmat suit no FA inspector is going to approach you. So ramp checks are off. It's wow, perfect. That's a, yeah, exactly. Just like one of the reasons why I was going to buy a, uh, a flying car, because with <laughs> a flying car, you know, you're out there at the airport, you got the wings all extended, and all of a sudden you see an FA inspector approaching, you hit the car switch, poof, airplane on top, car on the bottom, and the thing folds up like a transformer. Poof, 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 Boom, and it's a car now, and the inspector gets right to your window, you roll it down and say, ah, sorry, I'm a car now, sorry, can't do a ramp check, can't ramp check cars. Okay, maybe that's just me thinking that, but uh, it's on my wish I like list. I, 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 I like it a lot. My, my fiance Heidi likes to use the phrase of the gifts of COVID, of certain bright spots that have happened during all of this, and, and perhaps ramp checks is one of them that, that now you just have to, yeah. if anyone ever approaches you, whether you have the hazmat suit or you just start going, oh, sure. <laughs> Yeah. They, oh, they're all gone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Grabbing your heart always helps too. Like, uh, like that. And, and, and if I fall down, pick me up. Uh, those kind of things. I think that would, be, that would be perfect. Lean against the side of the airplane. Let your eyes roll to the back. No ramp checks whatsoever. That is gold. That's gold, Jeffrey. <laughs> There's a bright um, spot to everything. There is. You are on the cutting edge of bright spots. It's like watching a, a, a new sun being born. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, well, hopefully we can we can keep people flying as much as possible and doing that. I, Rod, I, I would love to have you back on the show. We could talk for hours and hours and hours. Um, I, I'd love to have you back. And it'd be it'd be a real pleasure. And by the way, let me say, if um, if for uh, social flight members, uh, remember these numbers and letters: two five O F F. 25 off, 250FF. For social flight members from now until Saturday night, that's 25% off anything that's digital, any digital product, which is about 95% of all my products, in my store at rodmachado.com. So go to rodmachado.com or becomeapilot.com. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I should take up smoking. I already have the cough. Uh, you know, smoking is four times worse than they originally thought. In the uh, they originally thought it would kill you, so it's best not to best to you know, not do that. But a rodmachado.com or becomeapilot.com, put anything in your cart, 25 off in the uh, discount coupon window, and uh, that'll give you 25% off. And you know what? It's been a real pleasure being with you too. You are a, a delight to talk to. You have a very quick mind and uh, it's uh, and the perfect host actually, it's just so easy. You got me talking and it's just like critical mass. I can't stop. <laughs> well, very, very kind of you. And yes, we will set up another date uh, to have you back. Uh, Rod Machado, again, rodmachado.com to anyone who's out there, becomeapilot.com. And that's very kind of you to offer everyone the 25% off uh, two five uh, OFF, 25 OFF as a code. Um, you've got uh, the private pilot's handbook, the instrument pilot's handbook, the instrument pilot's survival manual, how to fly an airplane, plane talk, and speaking of flying, among, I've got to believe, many, many other things there uh, on your website. I do. I have quite a few. So uh, that's part of what I do. So make it easy for people to learn.
Absolutely. Exactly. So everyone, thank you all so much for taking the time out and joining us again on Social Flight Live. Be sure to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps. You'll be able to find all of these and then you'll get information on that next show that we're also going to do and when Rob will be a guest again on Social Flight Live. Upcoming, we have some other great shows also in the works, of course, next Tuesday as every Tuesday night that we have at 8 p.m. Eastern time. We have Cool Tools Night where we're going to look at this little project yeah. behind me here of the T-51 Mustang and show you a little bit of our addiction to all things uh, sheet metal and tools and uh, some neat little things that we found in there. On November 14th at 8 p.m., that Tuesday, we've got Dale Klapmeyer, co-founder of Cirrus Aircraft, followed wow. up on wow. Tuesday, December 1st at 8 p.m., with Paul Bertarelli of AvWeb. And those are just the next few weeks coming up here on Social Flight Live. Again, Rod, thank you so, so much for joining us. It is greatly appreciated. And to everyone out there, I wish you all blue skies. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. And thanks for all you do for general aviation too. Thank you so much.